Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Gemology for Schmucks. My name is Peter Nelson, and I'm here to guide you in everything you need to know about gemstones. Today, we're going to be talking about a stone that has immense potential, particularly if it gets the rebranding that it deserves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by talking about what the stone is, some of the situations that surround it, and why I think it has immense opportunity. So first off, what is the stone? The stone in this ring right here, which many of you have been interested in, and may have been featured in a couple of other videos, is cat's eye jade. Cat's eye actinolite, mao yan yu to the Chinese. Now the English speaking world has a bit of a pushback on that and we'll explore a little bit later why that may be. But in Chinese, which is the oldest culture to be using jade and has popularized jade worldwide, they just directly say mao yan yu. Easy enough. So what is it? For some historical context, there are two types of jade worldwide. Historical jade, which is nephrite, and the much more recent fei cui. Some people like to call it jadeite, but the reality is it's an intergrowth of minerals inside of the pyroxene group. Jadeite is one of those alongside of omphacite and cosmochlor. Even major research labs are starting to come around to the term fei cui, because historical pieces found in museums that have been called fei cui for a long time before the foundation of those institutions, for example, are also an intergrowth and perhaps even more dominant of one of the other minerals rather than specifically jadeite. So if the ivory tower can come around to a new term, I think the rest of the world can as well. So one thing that is interesting about these two groups is they have a similar function in that they are part of a group of minerals that intergrow. So yes, they are the definition of a rock, but what amount of each mineral is in that final stone is not a part of the definition of whether or not it's jade, as long as it has those constituents. Jadeite, omphacite, cosmochlor, over in the pyroxene group, which we're not talking about today anymore, and over on the nephrite side, it's the amphibole supergroup, which subdivides in a whole bunch of other groups, but has some very key members, including actinolite and tremolite. Actinolite, tremolite, we may need to remember those names. Nephrite's definition is certainly murky. We start with amphibole minerals, and then the crystals, which are fibrous, need to basically felt. So it's more about the formation of that crystal structure than it is specifically which minerals of how much of a proportion. All we know is that it's probably gonna be tremolite and actinolite, and maybe some other stuff, but as long as it's felted, we're good. But as with many things in research, money drives it. So at this stage, nephrite is not humongously expensive, neither is cat's eye actinolite. So the time cannot be found for a lot of researchers to dive in and try and find clearer definitions. Frankly, considering the fact that we're already in a historical context where two very different groups of rocks are both being called by jade, I don't know that mineralogists really need to go and split those hairs. It's already a semantically bound category as opposed to one that could be measured and scooped. Though it is worth noting that even in historical times when Fei Cui started to go into China from Myanmar, the Chinese were fairly adept at identifying nephrite jade, or what they call soft jade, from this new material, which they called fate sui, not only by color, but also by feel. There is a difference in the two stones, also to some degree a difference in density. It's not by a lot, but those that are quite sensitive to it may pick up that difference. There are strange things out in the world. But we on this channel like to stick to definable, measurable things, so let's move on with our conversation. Nephrite being the historical jade, the one that they made axes out of since the Neolithic new rock. So the conclusion we have is that nephrite jade is a felted rock made out of actinolite and tremolite. Actinolite being this guy, tremolite being another one of the amphibole group. If you look at my pendant and you shine a light over it and inspect it from different angles, you'll actually see certain areas that swirl and have a different luster from the rest of the stone. If I were to take that off and get it analyzed in an advanced laboratory, we may find that is actually an isolated patch of actinolite. To my understanding, this cat's eye actinolite material grows inside of nephrite deposits. Huge boulders in certain areas, almost like an eye, or you can think of it maybe like a pit in a peach though perhaps not in the exact center, because what's exact center when you're dealing with lava? And so as they're processing those boulders, cutting off the other nephrite material, 
sometimes they find a pocket inside of the same boulder of actinolite material. So if nephrite and actinolite are growing inside of each other and they're that closely related, in fact actinolite being a part of nephrite, then why is it that the English-speaking world would push back? Well frankly, I don't think they're pushing back that far, and this is just a historical game of telephone. Somebody heard one thing from somebody and they just keep repeating it down the line. Which is why I believe that there isn't rigorous support for why actinolite should not be called cat's eye jade. The one small piece of an article that I found on this topic had a paragraph on the topic. And basically, it was a scientist from back in the 1970s that pushed back on the use of the term cat's eye nephrite. Again, we were talking about felting being an essential part of the definition for nephrite. But that shouldn't necessarily disallow the word jade. So because of that one article, nobody decided to pick up the conversation again, and everybody's been saying, no, no, it's a misnomer to call it cat's eye jade. No, 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 we can't do that. All because everybody heard it in their class from the ivory tower. Now, I'm all for science and definitions, but definitions should be measurable. And when something like nephrite is already so murky and ill-measured, and it's also the historical jade, then I would argue that cat's eye jade is the most appropriate term for this stone. Do be aware that gemological laboratories will not be giving you this term, at least for now. Because as we saw, there are two completely different types of rocks that are both historically called jade, and there's nothing that the ivory tower can do about it. They don't want to either. Why should they? Who wants to walk against the river? Well, too much Nixon going on here. But back to logic and reason, my position is that the argument is not fully fleshed out, and that everybody has just been towing the line set for them by somebody else. So cat's eye actinolite is a fibrous mineral of the amphibole group, and when it forms properly and those fibers run straight, it can conduct light from one side to another, giving us the cat's eye effect. One of my friends that works in an advanced lab and sees very high-end stones in large volumes, says that the sharpest cat's eye that he has seen was in cat's eye actinolite, not in the historical cat's eye, which is cat's eye chrysoberyl, the only stone that's allowed to be called cat's eye without a modifying mineral name, or stone name. So while I love this ring and I love this stone, I'm certainly not going to call this piece of cat's eye jade the end-all and be-all of cat's eye jades. This is everyday wear. So if we believe that that level of quality is out there, then that means that cat's eye actinolite is collectible both on a difference in phenomena and in body color. So that brings us around to the third part of this conversation, which is the growth potential of cat's eye jade, which I will continue to call it because I do not need the ivory tower to tell me what I can and cannot say, particularly when they have not defined within a sufficient scope what things are and are not. This is an area where I do not believe the foot has been properly placed. You can let me know what you think in the comments. So the growth in value potential of cat's eye jade is this. We have that scientific and social dilemma, and if that gets solved, and the general public knows cat's eye jade as cat's eye jade, rather than seeing reports that say cat's eye actinolite, getting confused and scared, then I believe that the market that is already open to the rest of the jade kingdom becomes much more fluid to access, both to buy and to sell. And that is good for everyone. As I mentioned before, there are also collectible qualities of cat's eye actinolite, meaning rare qualities both in color and in the phenomena of the cat's eye. So those that are able to get their hands on exceptional qualities of cat's eye jade stand to have incredible growth in the value of their stone as the stone gains traction. And I'm sure many of you are thinking that I've already got those stones. I wish, though I am looking for them. And one fundamental point to wrap up this conversation is that the color green is perhaps the most essential color for mankind. Our eyes are adapted to see the color green with more specificity and variety than any other color. On a primordial level, red and green are perhaps the most important. The only other that can be brought in to fight with that is going to be blue. How interesting that blue and red tend to bookend the visible spectrum, and green is right there in the center, a nice large swath. Those of you who have used the spectroscope know exactly what I'm talking about. So if green is so primordial, and there's great variety of green inside of cat's eye actinolite, then it should be a stone that people could easily love, and I believe that they can, they just haven't seen it. Even in a place like Bangkok that's regularly trading large volumes of gemstones, I have only seen trash qualities of cat's eye actinolite. Most of it has been spirited away to Chinese-speaking areas where it stands to get a higher price. But as far as I'm concerned, the base level price for nice qualities, which can be used in general jewelry, is still accessible for the general market. 
you get a nice green stone with a cat's eye effect for a very approachable price. At the time of this filming, ring sized stones are oftentimes in the low hundreds. Where will it go in the future? That's anyone's guess. So, let me know your thoughts in the comments, hit like, hit subscribe. If you want to get a hold of me directly, head over to gemshepherd.com. And until next time, bye bye.